Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CSIS. My name is Nikos Tsafos, and I'm a senior fellow with the Energy and National Security Program uh, here in the center. And I'm very excited for this morning's uh, presentation. Um, you know, we host a, a lot of outlooks here at, at CSIS, and um, every one of them has a twist that makes it makes it unique. Uh, and I think today's presentation, what really struck us as we as we look at the uh, the the NVGL outlook is uh, it's very transition-y. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of inflection points and discontinuities. Uh, so we're very excited for the for the conversation uh, that uh, we're going to have uh, this morning. Um, Zvere Alvik is uh, the program director for the uh, Energy Transition Outlook. So he and his team sort of put it uh, together. Um, and so we're going to have him come up here and present for a little while. And then I'm going to ask some questions and then we're going to open it up uh, to your questions. Uh, before we do that, always um, we take your safety at CSIS very seriously. Uh, so we're not expecting anything. But if we do have an emergency, uh, please look to myself and my CSIS colleagues. Uh, the easiest way out is the way you came in. Uh, if that, for some reason, is not available, please take a note of the emergency exits. Again, we're not expecting anything. <clears throat> just to be prepared. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zver. Thank you, and uh, good morning. So uh, my name is Sver Alvik. I've been working the last 20 years in the NVGL. And uh, the, five, the last five of those being responsible for our energy transition research. Uh, DNVGL is publishing uh, an annual uh, energy transition outlook every September. And this is the third edition, meaning it's not something we have done for, for decades as uh, IEA or, uh, or Shell or others, uh, but it's something we have started with because we think it's, it's very important. The NVGL is an uh, uh, international uh, ship classification, risk management advisory, and uh, certification uh, company with around 12,000 employees, of which 2,000 here in uh, US and headquartered in Oslo, Norway, where also I'm working. Uh, and the large businesses of the NVGL is, about, is in shipping, it's in oil and gas, and in power and renewables. And, and that's also one of the reasons we started with this work, uh, because the energy future is important to us and our customers. And we have a business in, uh, let's call it both the old and the new energy world, and, and a sizable business in both, and as such, no particular biases for a, a certain future we would like to see. Except that we, as everyone else, would also like to uh, achieve uh, Paris ambitions. So 70% of the NVGL's business is energy in one form or another. Uh, when we published this uh, two months ago, these are the headlines. I'll walk you briefly through them, and then I come back to all of this during the next 30 minutes. As we see it, we are in the midst of a rapid energy transition. And the energy future in 2050, or the energy world of 2050, will look very different from today. However fast, it's not fast enough to reach Paris ambitions, if that's what we are striving towards. Uh, energy efficiency is a sort of under-communicated hero of the transition we're going through. And that's giving us two very interesting conclusions. One, global energy use is set to peak in spite of economic growth, population growth, and more than a billion people being brought out of energy poverty. That can be done without using more energy. So in 10, 15 years, because we will use energy much smarter, energy, global energy use will peak. The other interesting conclusion from the efficiency is that the transition we have ahead of us is an affordable one. The world needs to spend a lower share of their GDP in the future on energy than we do today. So it's not an argument against the transition that we cannot afford it. The last point here is that the technology to deliver the future we want 
does exist. I'm sure that the future technology world will continue to surprise us, but we don't need fusion or other uh, thing we can dream of today in order to achieve uh, the Paris uh, future. We can do this with a scale up of PV, of wind, of uh, carbon capture and storage, electric vehicles, and other things that already exist. But if that is to happen, it needs much more policy help than it does today. Most energy forecasters are presenting scenarios, and we don't. We only have one forecast. Okay, you might choose to call it a scenario, but then it's only one. And that's not because we are certain on what the future will bring. I mean, we should be humble and say that the energy world of 2050 is unknown. But still, and I'm certain that the future will surprise us in positive and in negative ways. But we have chosen to present only one forecast because that gives us the ability to say that this is where we're heading. And then we could also say, is this where we would like to be heading? And how can we close the gap from where we are heading to where we would like to be heading? So this is not the future we want. This is the future we see as most likely unfolding with the momentum that's currently in the energy world. Most reactions uh, when we present our outlook is, is curiosity. So tell me how you derive to the conclusions you do. And you are an educated audience on energy outlooks. And you know and well understand that, that what we put into the model as input and assumptions is the key to what we get out. And here are the key inputs. And we should also remember in this one that the uncertainty increases as we go right in this figure. So population, we do forecast a little lower population growth than UN have in their median estimates. Uh, an Austrian institute called IASA that we rely on uh, takes to a larger account urbanization and female education driving down fertility trends uh, into their estimates. That gives us 9.4 billion people in 2050, little lower than UN median estimates, but again, the uncertainty of this is just a few percentage. There's much higher uncertainty in political and other things here. Economic growth will continue, but will also slow down as more and more economies enter the mature stage of the, of the, of the tertiary uh, economy, where um, efficiency gains are harder to get. So we have an average 2.5% over the 30 years, um, lower towards the end of the period, and obviously higher in uh, developing countries than in developed economies. So that gives us 130% growth over the next 30 years. Technology learning is very important for driving down costs of new technologies. And uh, the cost learning rates being the uh, reduction in a technology cost with a cumulative doubling of capacities is going to continue. And we see it's being between 15 and 20% for wind, solar, batteries, etc. going forward. Also established technologies has technology learning, but there a doubling of cumulative capacity could take decades so the annual improvements are very low. And finally, on policy. We could design the future we want just by tightening policies. But that's hardly happening in the real world, and then we should not let it happen in our model. So we have a policy light future, if, we could, if I could use that term. Uh, for example, we have carbon prices of between $25 and $60 per ton CO2 in 2050, depending on region. We also have uh, zero emission vehicle support. We have uh, uh, renewable energy support and others phased out as the technology becomes competitive. So 
This is also the area of highest uncertainty, because what is the carbon price in Southeast Asia in 2040? We don't know, but we have given it an estimate, because the alternative, to put it as zero, is even more unlikely. Sorry. We have made a regional model. No country, not even here in the US, is an island when it comes to the energy future. So we are dependent on what happens in the regions around us. And we have divided the world into 10 global regions. Uh, all our data are available on this breakdown, but not below. I will show quite a few uh, North American figures during this uh, presentation. But as you understand then, it's not US figures, it's US and Canada combined. So bear that in mind when you compare with others. Little bit of the, the North American figures. Population increase from 360 to 440 million people. Energy use <clears throat> per person is almost halving because also here we managed to use energy much smarter. So it's going down from 290 to 160 gigajoules, meaning global or uh, regional energy use as in total also reduced significantly. The GDP is having a modest growth only from 58 to 75,000 US dollar per person. Um, the energy system we have designed is a demand-driven one. It's energy demand that will decide the energy consumption of the future, not the supply. We will not run out of oil or gas or coal and definitively not of wind or solar. So it's the demand for energy that decides the world's energy consumption. And demand is mainly within three categories. It's buildings, transport, and industry or manufacturing, around a third in each of them. And in each of these, there is a rapid transition. And the sum of them, as you see on this graph, is actually peaking in the mid-30s. So then we reach an, a point where humanity will use less energy, and I'll explain why. But first, North America doesn't look exactly the same. You see here that North American energy use is, has already peaked. It's slowly uh, going down. Uh, and it's going down in both transport and manufacturing, while it's slowly increasing for the, the building sector. So what happens in transport? This is where there's probably the biggest difference between our forecast and many others, because we have a very strong belief in the electrification of the road transport sector. An electric vehicle has a 90% efficiency in its engine. A combustion engine vehicle has 25. That means that you could run three to four times as long on the same amount of energy. Yes, you need to take into account the, how the electricity is generated. And if it's from gas, then you reduce the efficiency gain to about half. But still, there is a difference. And renewable energy and a power system is also going to be more electric over time. In Norway, the first nine months of this year, 40% of the vehicles sold was electric. In China, it was 6%. In US, last year was 2.1. I don't remember what it's this year. We see this growth coming very fast. As soon as the car dealers have solved the range issue, the countries have solved the charging station issues, and the technology learning costs of batteries has brought the battery costs down to a competitive level. We find it almost impossible for the combustion engines to compete. And in our forecast, half of the world's vehicle sales is electric in 2032. And when we know that a quarter of the world's oil is used in the light vehicles, another quarter in heavy vehicles, we understand that this has an impact on global oil consumption. Because also in heavy vehicle segment, this is coming, not as fast, because it's a more diversified segment. 
But in buses, for example, it's coming very fast. There's already 500,000 electric buses in the world. While in other parts of the segment, like the most heavy part of the trucking segments, electricity is unlikely to be a solution. And here we see hydrogen is playing a role together with gas and, gas and biofuel. Uh, but we don't see hydrogen for light vehicles. In the building sector, there is enormous gains to be gathered, for example, in lighting. You know what the effectiveness of a kerosene lamp is? 2%. The 98% is heat. This is mostly used close to equator. You don't need the heat. It's 98% losses. If you replace that with a LED bulb and a PV panel, you get 50 times the amount of light for the same amount of energy. High efficiencies can also be gained in areas like uh, cooking, also in heating. While in others, like cooling, there is much less gains to be made, and the energy use is going to increase because people can afford more air conditioning, and it's going to be warmer, so they need more of it. So global energy use for buildings is slowly increasing. Some of the areas are, are um, uh, having high efficiency gains, others less so. In manufacturing of materials, which is the third big areas, area of energy demand, uh, there is also efficiency gains to be made, uh, partly because of a, a circular and sharing economy slowly uh, forming, partly because in the richer part of the world there is a limit for how many gadgets we need, but we do see that in the poorer part of the world, uh, they do want a standard of living which resembles ours. So there is a growth in energy consumption for, for, uh, for those areas. So in sum, we do see that the three, the transport, the buildings, and the manufacturing, large efficiency gains to be made in each of them. The global energy intensity improvements is 2.5% a year in our forecast. And you, when you compare that with an economic growth, which is 2.6% a year, and decreasing towards the end of the period, you understand why there is a peak in energy consumption. But then the electricity is coming from somewhere. And presently, 19% of it comes from electricity. That's going to more than double. Road sector electrifies. Not all the parts of transport sector, though. We don't see that shipping can electrify. We don't see that aviation can electrify. So in those two sectors, there is biofuel, there is ammonia, there is gas, and there is still oil use. But electrification uh, happens in the transport sector, in the building sector, and in the manufacturing sector. Still, there is a lot of oil, gas, and coal use left. And I have... Uh, illustrate them here as three individuals. If you look at coal first, the black line here, we see that global coal use is, uh, was peaking in 2014. It's relatively flat for the next decade. It's going down in US and in UK. It's going up in Indonesia and in uh, India and other Vietnam. And it's flat in China, which actually use more than 50% of the world's coal. Let's look at the two other ones, which, and I have a more detailed graph. We see that global oil demand is peaking in around five years from now. And as you understand, and as you know, this is different from many other forecasters. Most others see oil peaks between 2030 and 2040. And some doesn't want to call it a, uh, or admit that there could be a peak at all. We see it earlier, and as I said, the electrification of the road transport sector is the main reason for that. But also, the orange part here, the non-energy use, meaning the oil which is used for petrochemicals and plastics, we have a view which is a little different from others. We think that circulation or circularity of uh, plastics, for example, recycling, being, being it mechanical or chemical, will lead to that although petrochemical use can increase, the use of virgin feedstock to that uh, petrochemical sector might not continue to increase as a sort of and be the rescue for oil demand as as most forecasters see it. So we see global energy uh, oil use 
being 55% of what they are today in 2050. The decline is fast, but it's less steep than uh, the depletion of the fields. So in this future, you do need some new oil still. We also look at where the oil is coming from. And uh, oil is a global commodity, so it's not very important on whether uh, it's produced or consumed regionally. But this is the North American picture. And uh, let me admit first that our forecast is not very good at the shorter spikes. And, and what happens, uh, what's happening at the moment, and a new record in October for 12.6 million barrels, or whatever it was here for, for US, is not something you can see or forecast, more on the longer term trends. And then let me also add that in our model there is a discipline, meaning that the world is only producing the amount of oil that the world needs and is producing from the cheaper regions. That discipline might not exist in the real world. And, and uh, who knows what OPEC decisions will be in order to uh, let me say, allow US to continue to increase its uh, oil production because OPEC will maintain uh, the balance by, uh, in order to achieve a high price. This is indeed a risky picture going forward, but also we are, the oil industry is entering an area of uh, flattening and soon decreasing oil demand. Is anyone's guess who will be the oil producers? When I was in uh, Saudi and Emirates uh, a month ago, they were quite optimistic that, I hear what you say, but we have the cheapest oil, so for us it's not a big problem. So uh, the jury is out on this one. On gas use, there is less difference between our forecast and, and, uh, main, uh, and, and many other forecasters. We do see that gas becomes the largest energy source, higher than oil, in a decade from now. And global gas use is increasing uh, in first and foremost in buildings and manufacturing and relatively flat in, in power stations uh, globally. In general, OECD consumption of gas is relatively flat, while non-OECD is increasing. Also here, North American picture. Uh, and you already uh, see, see here that it will be a large net exporter of gas. And that gives a couple of interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, the net uh, export of gas from North America, or LNG in general, is making gas a more global commodity. It's equaling out gas prices uh, globally. And, and the, um, uh, but some of the countries, like Norway as an example, uh, exporting and Russia exporting gas to Europe with pipes are more stuck to the regional demand while those producing LNG uh, could export everywhere. We see a limited future for hydrogen at least in the 2050 uh, perspective. The main reason is that hydrogen is um, expensive from a capital point of view with uh, low temperature uh, high pressure uh, challenges and uh, you lose in the conversions, uh, either 50% one way or 50 plus another 50 when you convert it back again to electricity. So, so it's a lot of conversion losses. 4% uh, here in North America, so it's regionally dependent of, of, uh, with nuclear, and around half of it from steam methane reforming, the other half from uh, electrolysis from uh, wind and solar. The Power system is the one that can decarbonize fastest. It's the easiest part of the energy system to, to decarbonize. And already today, wind and solar is the cheapest form of energy in most countries, new wind, for, of new energy. Maybe not entirely here in the US because you have the cheapest gas, but also here it's competitive. And in 2050, the energy system will look dramatically, electricity system, will look dramatically different from what it does today, with around one third of solar and almost one third of wind. And this growth is 40-fold for solar, 10-fold for onshore wind, and 100-fold for offshore wind. So it's a dramatic growth, although it starts from a low level, it's going to take over and dominate the energy, the electricity system of the future. Um, in North America also, 
we do see that coal is phased out on relatively few years. Gas maintains, but grows only in the first decade, then it uh, reduces. And wind and solar is also here growing. Wind, actually, we see likely to dominate the North America electricity production in 2050. This is not coming of itself. An electricity system with two-thirds of variable renewables needs to be very different from today. And it, it does introduce a lot of challenges because the wind is not always blowing and the sun is not always shining. And there's three major areas to, to uh, uh, help that. One is connectivity, so you need more cables everywhere. The second one is storage. You need to, to be able to store energy, especially of, for a 24-hour basis from the middle of the day when the sun is producing to, to the night. And the last one is uh, demand response. Ideally, if you... Uh, if you tailored the, the uh, demand for energy after the supply of our electricity, there wouldn't be a problem at all because you would then demand electricity only when it was produced. So, of course, perfect demand response doesn't exist. But there will be amounts of it in the energy system uh, by varying prices and all that to help lowering the peaks. We have done this by modeling the energy system on an hourly scale, taking into account that... For example, all the PV produces in the middle of the day typically get a lower average price than the gas that you can be turned on on demand. So when we analyze the competitiveness between the various power sources in our model, we do look at the profitability of the various, uh, not only the levelized cost, but also the profitability of the various alternatives. But the energy system of the future does look dramatically different from what it does today. Then we call it an affordable transition. And that is because although absolute investments in energy or expenditures on energy is growing from around 4,500 billion US dollar a year to 5,500 billion dollar a year, that's a 30% growth, the economy is growing 130% in the same period. So the share of the global economy that needs to be spent of energy is almost halving over the forecast period. Yes, it's also a, a, a change. You need a lot of investments in the grid system, in building out renewables, uh, and you need less investments in the fossil industry. But it's not an argument against the transition that we cannot afford it, because it will be a cheaper energy world than it is today. All this looks as a fast transition, until we start looking at emissions, then it's definitively not fast enough. We see global um, uh, CO2 emissions from energy peaking in mid-20s. In 2030, they're the same as today. In 2050, they're around 60% of the present level. If you remember IPCC's one and a half degree report, and what they said about emissions. They said that they need to half by 2030, half again by 2040, and be close to zero at 2050. You clearly see that this is not in line with the Paris Agreement. Do we have much? Uh, no. And then, to be more detailed, as we see it, we are emptying the one and a half degree carbon budget in less than a decade. We're emptying the two degree carbon budget before mid-century. And although we don't run our model beyond 2050, uh, here we have extrapolated the trends, the emission trends. Uh, and then, based on that, we could say that this is a two and a half degree future. So most likely, as the NVGL sees it, we are heading towards two and a half degree. That is not business as usual. First, it's not the three and a half or four degrees uh, which could happen if nothing happens. But it's also very far from the ambition of well below two degrees striving towards one and a half that the Paris Agreement set out to do. Is it possible to reach Paris? 
Yes, but it's extremely difficult. If we are to achieve it, we need more electricity and even more of that from renewables. We need further reductions in energy intensity on top of those 2.5% improvements that we uh, have in our forecast, including probably behavioral changes. And we need to succeed with uh, carbon capture and storage on an industrial scale, both from power, from industry, and later from, uh, with net negative emissions from bioenergy. Each of these are not enough. We need all three of them, and we need a lot of all three of them. So to summarize, we are in the midst of a rapid transition. The NVGL sees the energy future of 2050 very different from what it does today, with large efficiency gains ensuring both peak energy and an affordable transition. And the technologies to deliver one and a half degree target are there, but you need much more policy if that is to be achieved because we are not at the right track at the moment and the main uncertainties in the future we forecast as we see it is on the policy side. Finally, we made all these uh, available uh, in a thick report called our Energy Transition Outlook, three companion reports uh, for the power industry, for the oil and gas industry, and for the maritime industry. All this can be downloaded from our websites. And the same you could do with the, all the data behind uh, the forecast. Thank you. Well, thank you, Zvarit. This was a, an excellent um, summary of where you guys got to. Um, I'm going to start at the sort of very, very beginning, um, which is um, that's a lot of change. And as I listen you present, um, every time you came to a major challenge, um, you know, you talked about the circular economy, EVs. Um, you listed a, a series of very serious obstacles that we face, uh, whether these are batteries, infrastructure. Uh, you know, you talked about energy efficiency as the sort of uh, underappreciated hero. People usually refer to energy efficiency as kind of like the low-hanging fruit that no one cares about, uh, that never sort of reaches its potential. So I guess the, the very macro question is, you know, you seem to have resolved a lot of the things that we're struggling to resolve in order to make this transition possible. So for lack of a better phrasing, why are you so optimistic that we're actually resolving all these challenges? Yeah, the main driver for uh, the changes we see in our model uh, is, the, is the cost differences. And, and uh, we do let the various energy sources uh, compete on cost. For example, in our EV model, uh, we, we have everything from, uh, from petrol price to, to battery price uh, and electricity prices and, and all that included. So it's not so that we design the future we have. In most of the, the changes we see, we see it's, it's cost driven. Uh, and, and it's helped by the large efficiency gains that you get from electricity in, in particular. There are exceptions to that. For example, in the aviation sector, when we say that we think there will be a significant share of biofuel, that is not cost-driven, that is mandate-driven. Uh, uh, so, so there are some areas where we think that the, the, uh, the world will we need to solve the problems by putting in mandates, but most of the momentum that we have in our forecast, and that's why we call it a policy light, is cost-based. But we, we could, you could call us technology optimists. So, for example, that we believe that the technology uh, or the learning curves of, uh, of solar and wind will continue downwards. That is a self-reinforcing loop, because the more you get of it, the cheaper it gets. And the same for batteries. So it could also be that our sort of technology optimism is, is some of the reason why we end up with a, a more rapid forecast than some other forecasters do. Let me pick up on this policy light, um, because on the one hand, you, you, you described the outlook as policy light. Uh, 
there is a lot of policy embedded, though, in the forecast. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, both what policies you're assuming, you, you alluded to some of them, but also one of the challenges is we oftentimes know what the policy is, but we can't seem to implement it or agree that this is the policy and it can get through on a political end. And this is not just about the United States. I mean, in Europe, there's a big debate about you know coal and how quickly you can phase out coal. It doesn't feel like economics is driving kind of like everything and a lot of politics is involved. And even when you do know or you think you know what the right policy is, you know, the politics of policy can be quite mm. challenging. So tell us how, how you think about that interplay. Yeah, it, it's very hard. And we, we often call it a, a Paris pledges discipline. I mean, what discipline is there in a country to ensure that the ambitions you have will be met? And in some countries, like uh, China, that discipline is often very high. In other countries, like India, it's, it's much less so. Uh, so if Europe now, for example, is, is likely to um, agree on a much stricter uh, environmental reduction or emission target than they had uh, have had, what policies are they going to, uh, or how are they going to enforce that with policies? Uh, that, that's very hard uh, guesses. So, so we are uh, including, for example, on, um, on uh, subsidies for, for electric vehicles. We have something we call a regional ability and willingness factor. So the regional ability, for example, in, in Africa is, is minor. They don't have an ability to sponsor. They can't afford it. The regional willingness is higher in Europe than it is in North America. So, so we, we use factors like that to uh, try, try to take the sort of the various uh, policy uh, tendencies in the, in the different regions into account. Um, and, and when I say modest, it's, it's, uh, first it's based on that we don't automatically let any ambition sort of uh, uh, ensure uh, that result is achieved in our model. And secondly, when we, when we have carbon prices, for example, in the range of, uh, of $25 to $60 a ton, we know that the real externality price of CO2 emissions typically is at least $100 or between $1 and $200 a ton. We are never near that. In, in our forecast. So we're not designing it by sort of tightening policies too much. Let me now uh, zoom in on some of the specific numbers that, that you uh, put up uh, that kind of like stood out for me as, as uh, striking or surprising. Uh, one of them was a, a huge decline in uh, manufacturing energy use in North America. Um, and I assume from everything you've described that this is sort of a, a circular economy, sort of efficiency uh, uh, driven, but walk us through kind of like what does that what does that look like? I mean, if the industrial energy use in, in in the U.S. hasn't really shown that kind of of gains, or, or when you do get efficiency, you get higher industrial output. So so walk us through kind of like how you get to that to that outlook. Uh, first, we look at the global uh, amount of manufacturing. And after that, we sort of when we sort out the global uh, manufacturing production based on, again on the regional demands, then we look at which regions is likely to produce them. And, and uh, it is very hard to say on whether there will be onboarding or onshoring again of uh, uh, U.S. production of uh, textiles and other things. So whether it will continue to be done in Vietnam or Bangladesh or, or, or other areas. Uh, so, so what we have done there is to use uh, trends, extrapolation of, uh, of, of what has happened the last decades and on decade, and, and continuing that. So that is one main reason for why we see that North American production of, of, of goods, uh, finished goods, is, is declining. So, so it's more global economy than efficiency. Is that a fair way to describe it then? Yes. Okay, that, that's fair. Um, the other thing that was sort of surprising, you know, there there are not a lot of uh, most of your demand curves kind of like bent and, and flattened out, but not for buildings. Um, and I guess uh, when I looked at the, I think it was the the global picture, you know, we don't seem to make a lot of progress in getting people to use more efficient air conditioners. 
uh, or space heating, which again could go down if you had better insulation and enveloping of buildings. Um, I guess my question is, in every other sector, we seem to be making sort of a lot more progress in, in achieving what's possible. You don't share the same optimism in buildings, at least not generally. I mean, you talk about lamps, uh, lighting, but you didn't, you didn't seem to share that optimism in sort of space heating or cooling. So uh, maybe walk us through kind of like why, why is that? Yeah, I think in the, in the building sector, there is, uh, first, a lot of the building stock is very old. So if, if all the buildings was new, then you would have a lot of freedom. And in those regions where there is a lot of new buildings, then, then you have large, much easier efficiencies. But how to enforce uh, refurbishment or, or uh, dismantling and building new uh, buildings uh, when they're privately owned, uh, or, or uh, we, we find that less likely to happen. Then, uh, for example, in the in the, the transport industry, which has a very fast turnover, I mean, even a car only lasts for 15 years, and and uh, or in the industry where there is uh, sort of the bigger, uh, more cost optimum uh, thinking that that uh, each of us as individuals often fail to do. I mean, we don't insulate our houses until it's mandatory, although it's uh, profitable uh, from a 10 years perspective. That's the reason why we're less optimistic on the, the building sector. Um, let me zoom in a little bit more on North America. There's a couple of things that uh, sort of stood out to me in your, in your forecast. Um, one is sort of the how quickly you uh, get rid of coal uh, in the forecast. That's one. Um, while you're doing that, there's also a very steep decline in both uh, oil and gas. So, Oil is a different part, of course, but also gas. I mean, there. Uh, although you're globally, uh, quote unquote, bullish on gas, you sort of see gas taking over as the dominant, the largest fuel uh, in the world. But in North America, which has the cheapest gas, you, you forecast sort of a decline. Um, so maybe kind of walk us through that that the, the gas the gas outlook for North America. So. So first, there is not a decline in gas the first five years. And then it's just uh, sort of uh, the decline of coal is so steep that when you, you sum them, it's, it, it's the decline. There is still an increase in gas in a five-year perspective. But, but then it's, it's leveling off and declining in a 10-year plus, 10 plus year perspective. Um, also, gas in North America is probably going to be more expensive as uh, we have uh, more of it liquefied and sent abroad and you get a more global uh, gas price. Um, it's purely cost-based when we phase out the coal in, in our model. And um, it's, it's also, uh, well, one thing is that you might not retire the coal plants, but you could choose, to, I mean, it's not necessarily profitable to operate them. So you will run them on very low uh, utilization, uh, meaning the production from them is, is very low. But I must also admit that when I spoke with IEIA yesterday, uh, they they uh, told me more about sort of the various types of, of plants and all that and, and also told me that you're probably underestimating that some of the plants we have here, coal plants, are very profitable and, and are likely to, uh, to, to may be maintained. So, so I've had that reaction before and it could well be that we are too bullish on the, the decrease of, uh, of coal power uh, production in, here in, in North America. And are there other parts of the gas consumption picture that sort of in the outside of the power generation for North America that you think are worth kind of talking about? Or is the decline mostly driven by what's happening in the power sector? It's, it's mostly in the power sector. Uh, there, I mean, in the, in the building uh, heating sector, uh, over, over in a longer perspective, uh, it's probably likely to, to mixture natural gas with hydrogen in areas like California and others that has uh, gas pipelines uh, into the houses. And in the industry, uh, we are constantly looking at what part of the gas uh, consumption that can be replaced with, with a more efficient electricity. But these are less pronounced than, uh, the, the, than the reduction in the power sector. Excellent. I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to turn it to you, so if you are thinking about a question, uh, sort of get it, get it uh, question ready. Um, 
the one thing you didn't talk as much about, but obviously it's a big part of your outlook as well as your uh, compendium reports, is the maritime sector. So I was wondering if you could just walk us through a little bit what you see on the on the maritime sector. Uh, obviously, one of the harder areas to decarbonize. You alluded to the fact that electrification probably won't really work for mm. the maritime sector. And so, how do you see the maritime sort of fuel mix evolving? Yeah. So, so this is an area which is very important to DNVGL. I mean, we are the world's largest ship classification society, and 20% of the ships sailing on the oceans are classed by us. So we have a lot of, I have a lot of colleagues who's working on detail on this. And, and decarbonization of the maritime industry is uh, on the very top of the, uh, of the agenda. At the moment, uh, of course, there's a lot of focus on the 2020 sulfur cap that comes into force in only a month and a half. So, so also very short term, there will be big changes in maritime fuel mix. But longer uh, perspective, uh, the IMO decision of, uh, or strategy of reducing absolute emissions 50% uh, to 2050 uh, is, is causing a headache for the industry. Uh, and, it's, and in order to meet that, we're working on a lot of different things at the same time. One is um, improvements in efficiencies. So, and then I mean utilization of the vessel. So everything from sort of smart, uh, smart operation of the, of the, uh, the ships to, to, to uh, reduced port time is part of that. The second is uh, efficiency of the hull and the engines itself. The third one is speed limits uh, on the sea, because if you reduce uh, sailing speeds of the ships, they will go much, uh, they will use much less energy. And the fourth and most important one is sort of decarbonizing the maritime fuel. Medium term, uh, gas can help a little bit, uh, but it's only between zero and 20% improvement. Longer term, the jury is still out to what is the best solution for maritime fuel. It cannot be electricity, except for very short haul uh, or short sea uh, ferries and, and things like that. Um, ammonia looks like a very promising solution. Uh, and in our forecast, there is 17% ammonia in the 2050 fuel mix for shipping. Uh, but I would say it's, it's a lot of things on the pilot stage at the moment. So, so whether it will be ammonia or hydrogen or bio or synthetic uh, biomethane or whatever, I think the jury is out. But there's a lot of work being done on that at the moment. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to now come over to you. Very uh, few house rules here at CSS. Number one, wait for the mic. Number two, introduce yourself. Number three, question in the form of a question and bonus points for brevity. Uh, uh, wait for the mic. <laughs> Adam Siegel, Insight Through Analysis. Uh, uh, following up on sort of the optimism where I'd like this to be true and like it to be even truer, more optimistic, um, two examples of where in your presentation and struggling over the optimism. For the past 20 years or so, Global energy intensity improvement has been 1.6%, and you have 2.5%. Loved it to be three or four, but what's the justification for jumping up that much? And then as an example, sort of as a throwaway almost, we have the existing technology, solar, wind, batteries, carbon capture. Um, carbon capture really for many of us is at the edge, very expensive and otherwise. What's your optimism on the carbon capture as an existing technology? Okay, uh, if, I, if I take the latter one first, uh, we are not optimistic on carbon capture and storage. Unfortunately, I would like to be, because I do see and I want to, and I did present this as part of the solution if you are to achieve Paris ambitions. But unlike solar and wind and, uh, and batteries, we don't see anyone is investing, not even mandating use of carbon capture and storage. So very little is happening the first 15 years. And in our forecast in 2050, there is 800 megatons of carbon capture and storage. That's around 3 to 4% of global emissions. That's a quarter of what IEA, for example, has in their central uh, forecast. So although I would like to see much more of it, uh, then, the, um, then the CCS uh, uptake, uh, as we see it, is, is low. 
the other one, sorry, was efficiency. Yeah, efficiency, yeah. Yes, you're right. We, we also mentioned in the report that it's 1.6% in, in average the last two decades. Uh, the electrification itself is the one that is causing uh, or giving us this, this optimism. Because the electricity, or the, uh, when, you, when you put in the electrification, especially of the road uh, transport sector, the electricity is, is giving that additional boost. Uh, sort of that additional percentage from the historical 1.5 to the to the future 2.5 uh, percent. So that's the main reason for that jump, if you want to call it that. Hi, I'm Fernando Batista. I just wanted to know where you're at with the hydro um, power uh, reduction. Why do you see that reducing um, or falling rather than going up a little bit? So, uh, for hydropower, uh, in some regions, uh, hydropower production is, is flat. Uh, and that's where we have more or less exhausted the, the options that can be done without sort of a, a lot of uh, local environmental conflicts. Uh, in, in other areas, like in, in China, uh, Latin America, and uh, later also in Sub-Saharan Africa, we do have a, a growth. So overall, global hydro production is, is growing in our forecast. But in some regions, uh, like here, it's relatively flat because we, we think it's sort of exhausted uh, the options uh, more or less already. Then there is a factor we have not accounted for, which could be worth to do in, uh, in the future, and that is, will climate change in itself cause more precipitation? Maybe in the order of 10%, and if so, would that maybe lead to an equal increase in, in hydropower uh, production? That's not something included so far. Okay, people are gathering their questions, which gives me an opening to ask a few more then. Um, Nuclear. That's the question. <laughs> in in uh, in our model, there is little nuclear. Uh, there is, and it's not because we we cannot see it as a possible solution, but it's because it's very expensive. Um, so it, it, the only new nuclear which is being built in our model is is in China, and it's more or less building the existing pipeline. There is a very few others. And then uh, our model does not choose to build any new nuclear. In fact, renewable plus storage is cheaper than nuclear, uh, as, as we see it. Then we must admit that uh, nuclear sometimes is decided from an energy security point of view still. Like the Hinkley B plant in UK, our model didn't want to build that, but the British politicians wanted. So then we had to include it. So, so uh, nuclear is, is an energy source which is somewhat difficult to forecast but we do perceive it to be uh, expensive um, yes hi sir Zombri from the embassy of Hungary and I have a question because you mentioned that uh, governments need to do like more policy work uh, on this how do you see the role of the private sector and I specifically think about like one initiative the oil and gas Climate Initiative, if you could just elaborate on that. Thank you. Yes, uh, the NVGL uh, uh, engages a lot in this, both through the UN Global Compact and through the uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And the, the private sector has a very important role to play, uh, both on the, on the sort of energy side, obviously, but also on the, on the climate side. And, and a lot of the innovation and, um, and R&D that is being done uh, including on the breakthrough technologies that I have not talked of, because when we say talk about most likely, it's very hard to talk about possible breakthroughs. But they will come, but just that we don't know what they are or what will be. So we do see that the private sector has a very important role to play uh, in order to, to, to scale, in order to, to innovate, uh, uh, but but it, the private sector needs to frame conditions that sort of makes it thrive and, and uh, uh, the policies that sort of uh, encourage uh, investments in, in uh, yeah, future energy from the private sector. Can I do a follow-up on that and I'll come to you? Um, one of the things that struck me as I look at uh, 
the, ra the huge deployment of renewable energy is the question of do we have the right business models to, to really allow for that? Like, I mean, you described basically, you know, EVs being the grid balancers. Uh, and so how do you think the structure of the electricity market, what is embedded in your forecast sort of make that possible? Uh, first, the business model of the present business model of the electricity market will not work. When we do calculation of that, we sort of give negative uh, in, uh, return on investments for a lot of new solar and wind, and and uh, then no one will build solar and wind. And I'm certain that the the legislators will solve that uh, with because they do want a lot of solar and wind, and then you need to make a, a sort of a business model where, where this can happen. So, so uh, without having the solution at hand, I am, we do foresee changes in the business models there. Then there are, on business models, there's also a lot of other interesting things which I didn't talk of. For example, on, uh, on uh, automated uh, transport. So, um, the number of vehicles in the world is likely to increase from around 1 to 1.7 billion private vehicles, that is. And, and if it wasn't for uh, automated and sharing uh, transport, it would have been even half a billion more. So in our model, 50%, 40% of the kilometers in 2050 are driven by automated vehicles. Not 40% of the, of the vehicles, but 40% of the kilometers. That in itself does not necessarily give reduced energy use because if transport is very cheap, there could be more of it rather than less. But, but that's another area where sort of uh, uh, sharing economy, carpooling and other type of business models is going to, to sort of revolutionize uh, or at least change the energy future. Hi, uh, Bill Eichert, consultant. Um, Question, and I may have misread your chart on North American energy. Uh, you got a pretty large number for geothermal energy, and I wanted to make sure that, that I saw that right and what you were including in geothermal energy. Um, and, and secondly, on geothermal, um, you mentioned the growth of coal use in Indonesia. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you might see as a possibility for expanded geothermal in Indonesia? Yeah, I don't think we have much geothermal energy in North America. Uh, I, I, yeah, maybe I was wrong, because I, uh, to my knowledge, there is not a lot of potential here. Indonesia, on the other hand, there is potential, uh, and, and, and uh, obviously on Iceland and, and other areas as well. I, we, we do consider geothermal uh, globally to be relatively marginal, around 1% of energy use. Same as solar thermal, around 1% of, of the global energy use. Uh, in Indonesia, I have, uh, I have not studied myself, but I read studies that there is potential for uh, uh, powering around 3, billion, uh, 3 million homes with geothermal energy, which is fair enough. It's, it's, a, it's a significant number. but. But again, in, in Indonesia, there is probably more than 50 million homes. So still, that is less, only 5% of, of Indonesia's energy use, which is one of the most potential areas. Let me do one more then. Actually, oh, okay. I'm Doug Hollett with uh, MH Technologies. I was just curious about the feedback loop that might be in the model, in other words, you know, in a two in a two two and a half degree trajectory, what does that do to energy use and requirements that basically countermand some of the projections that you have? Uh, a few places we have included uh, feedback loops from temperature for temperature increase itself, and and that is in uh, in uh, cooling needs, so increased needs for air conditioning globally, in heating needs, so uh, less need for heating in uh, in larger parts of the world. Uh, in other areas, we have not included those feedback loops. As I said, for example, on precipitation, there is probably a feedback loop and, and others. And, and we should, we, we could do that. But also, we should admit that we are not climate scientists. We're sort of energy researchers. So, so I try to, to, uh, to some extent, I, I present this as a two and a half degree. And then I would like to let sort of the climate scientists take it from there. So what is the global consequences of a two and a half degree 
uh, temperature increase in terms of, uh, of droughts and flooding and refugees and who knows what. That's not an area where we're experts on. Can I ask you one more? Uh, towards the end, you talked about the economics of all this, and you said it's an affordable uh, transition. Can you walk us through kind of like what that math looks like and how you get to those kind of like aggregate numbers? Mm -hmm. So uh, our model, I'm actually ju just as we speak writing, a, or uh, at least this week, writing a feature article on this. So we will publish on DNVGL within a week or two uh, another small article on the affordability of the transition. Um, what you include as energy expenditures is always up for debate. And, and we have a, a quite small or strict definition, which is only the, the oil and gas and coal extraction and, and sort of development costs. They're all the cost to the power system and uh, the, the uh, uh, installation and operation of the, of the renewable energy. So we don't have energy efficiency costs. We don't have subsidies, uh, neither fossil nor renewable included. Using our definition, you do get uh, global expenditures, capex and opex, in the range of $4,500 billion a year today. Energy costs as such is not going to be cheaper. So when we say, I mean, it's, it's actually slowly increasing. Most energy costs, I mean, uh, produ production of solar and wind is cheaper, but the grid system is much more advanced. So in average, one unit of energy costs around the same in the future as it does today. So when we have only a modest increase from 4,500 to 5,500 billion dollars, that is because there is only a, a moderate increase in energy use as a whole. Uh, then uh, you, we divide that on the uh, size of the economy which is growing 130% over the period. And that's why we end up with only using 2% of the future GDP on energy compared to 35 today. Then there is a good question on what would happen if we were to achieve Paris. Would that be very costly? We have not done those calculations ourselves, but the Energy Transition Commission, they have done uh, calculations on that, and they find a figure of between 0.4 and 0.8% of global GDP that needs to be invested in addition in order to reach Paris ambition. So if you add 0 0.4 to 0.8% on our decreasing affordability uh, graph, then you see that even if you were to achieve Paris, you could do that using less or some lower share of the uh, economy on energy than you do today. Uh. Well, this has been uh, a great a great discussion. You, you've given us a lot to uh, think about. You've uh, you've come to Washington and, and made us feel optimistic about the world, which is which is nice. Um, but uh, I just wanted to thank you again. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. You've given us a lot to to think about and work through. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, you know talking about this more in the future. So please join me in thanking Sverre.